Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense, common knowledge, or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do, but only 0.1% a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. Brandon Hopkins is an assistant research professor at Washington State University. He's a laboratory manager for the WSU apiary program, which means bees. So we're going to talk about bees. Uh, Brandon, thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me here. I look forward to talking to you about it. Yeah, I'm doing a series on bees and then another one on ants. So, uh, you know, you're my third bee person or fourth bee person. So glad to speak Great. to you. Well, tell me about why are you interested in bees and then what are you working on in regards to them? Yeah. When I started my PhD, I wasn't particularly interested in bees per se, research in general, cryopreservation and reproductive biology, but it didn't take me long, really. I mean, once I got started working with, with bees, it was real easy to to get kind of addicted to, to beekeeping and the honeybee world. So uh, they're fascinating creatures. It's a super cool model organism to work on and, uh, you know, a lot of need for, say, improvement in assisted reproductive techniques in honeybee breeding yeah i've heard i don't know if i have this right but when a bee is mate with the queen she can hold their semen i guess for sometimes years yeah and i i think you know in the literature that probably mentioned some you know like five to seven years or something which is incredible a few other species that that do that i mean there's some birds that can store sperm uh, you know maybe turtles and snakes but yeah not very many and you know, for that extended period of time. And it's amazing too, because they, they only mate that one time really in their life when they first become, you know, a queen and head a colony. And then they store everything that they're going to need for their reproductive lifespan. I guess they have a, a one night stand with lifetime consequences, but good ones. And that's right. Yeah. And it's a pretty, yeah, it's a vigorous one night stand usually with many, you know, with the, yeah, I mean, that's part of what I thought was so cool is that, you know, we have worked, you know, pretty hard to say in even some of these species where they've spent, invested billions of dollars in sperm storage type stuff. And, you know, to be able to keep semen fresh for a few days, like in something like a, in cattle is, is pretty difficult to do. So what does bee semen look like in, versus other animals? And has anyone look, looked at, you know, humans versus monkeys versus dolphins versus, you know, like done a study of let's say sperm across many many different creatures yeah kind of like this comparative morphology of the sperm and so yeah there is you know some of that work i i don't know about you know using that to to kind of figure out about storage but certainly in the honeybee semen is very odd i mean maybe not comparative to the insect world in general but just compared to what you probably saw like in videos in health class in high school or something like that. So they, they're very, very long. They're, I don't know, 10, you know, 10 to a hundred times longer maybe than say human sperm cells, which are much more like cattle or mouse sperm. So honeybees are very long. I can't remember off the top of my head, but, and they're really thread-like. So the classic sort of image you get is the, the head of a sperm and this small little wiggly tail, whereas in honeybees, you almost really can't see the head of the sperm at all. So it looks like these really long thread-like cells, and they don't really have like a forward motility swimming. Say like if you put it on a, di a slide and looked at it, they don't have this forward momentum. And it makes it kind of difficult to study because there are a lot of really cool tools that use computer imaging to measure sperm viability and things like that based on their forward momentum the velocity and things um, do they, but, are they motile at all or are they just yeah they're motile but they do these big wave-like motions or they do these big sort of rapid circles and so it's almost no mention of real forward motility in honeybee sperm in on a dish or on a slide so are they like There's, sea snakes do they like are they like serpents and how they move or how do they move? Yeah, kind of. And they, in some cases, they kind of 
almost become synchronous with the cells next to them. And so you can have these huge, I don't know what you call it, you know, a conglomerate of these spermatozoa that are kind of moving together synchronously in these large waves. So some of it might just be mechanical. I mean, the fact that they're on this dish or in this aqueous solution without female reproductive tract to provide them the, the structure to swim forward. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, what happens in fertilization? Do they wrap around an egg cell or do they enter the same way like human sperm do? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know that anyone really knows. It would be great to capture some images, kind of say like electron micrographs of sperm on an egg or during that fertilization. But no, in general, so it doesn't really happen like in mammals because a lot of insects, you know, that deposit their eggs out in the environment have to have kind of, you can think of like a shell on a chicken egg. It's called a chorion. And so they have a micro pile. So the sperm can't sort of fertilize anywhere on the surface of an egg. It has the sperm have to find the micro pile. And that's where that fusion occurs and fertilization happens. So the queen can control the release of sperm as an egg comes by. And that's part of why she can store it for a long time. So she has the spermatheca is a storage organ and then basically like a little tube that goes down and then meets up with the reproductive tract and so she has like a little muscle there and she can control the opening of that spermatical duct and so she deposits i think in the literature it says say like 13 to 20 sperm onto each egg as it kind of passes through and then those sperm would probably sort of compete to find their way to that micro pile at like the end Here. of the egg it's like pregnancy on demand and the way that the sperm are deposited, it sounds like a factory making cupcakes and, you know, the cupcake egg comes by and then <laughs> the, the icing sperm get deposited onto it and it moves on the conveyor. You know? well, that's right. It is like a conveyor belt. And it, I mean, it has to be that way. If um, these queens are to stay productive, they, they can produce a thousand to fifteen hundred eggs per day. Wow. And so so they, uh, do they store like millions and millions of sperm? Like, what's the um, the amount that they tend to store? Uh, they store about a microliter of sperm, uh, and that density is usually say between six and seven million sperm per microliter. So it's you know maybe five to eight million in that range. Interesting. So I guess you can calculate on average how many um, breeding cycles a queen can go through before they're exhausted, right? Probably, yeah, you probably can, and then in you, it, you do have to take into account, so I'd say 1,000 to 1,500 per day, and that would be, say, like at the peak of the growth cycle throughout the year, you know, but like right now, in most places in the northern hemisphere, at least, it's reproduction is almost zero. Certainly here in Pullman, it's snowing right now, and there's four inches of snow on the ground. Um, they're not using any sperm, right? They're not producing the offspring at all right now, and they haven't really been for a couple months. So, so what not, do they look like in the storage organ? Like, do they... Are they, oh, that's a how great do they question. feed? Are they feeding? Like, what are they doing? That's a really great question. And that's one of the kind of fascinating things about, so sperm are these terminal cells, right? They don't have like the cellular mechanics going on, say that like skin cells or other organs, you'd imagine in a body where like cells can kind of die and then those cells can be replaced through like cell division and there's mechanisms for like repairing cells and all that stuff, but sperm cells are terminal. They don't have any of that sort of transcription going on. So sperm can't really repair themselves or replace themselves. So, you know, to imagine how those sperm cells stay viable for even a year, let alone like three or four years is pretty cool. And so I think one thing that we kind of know about that is that they are stored in the spermatheca in what they call like a quiescent state, right? So they're quiet. They're not motile inside the spermatheca, which is super cool in itself. Whereas like during the male has to, you know, deposit that sperm and it has to be highly motile. And you can think of it as a very competitive environment because she might mate with 20 males. And so that's 20 microliters and she's only going to store one microliter. And so you know, to be that one out of 20 that makes it, you have to be highly motile and you, you've you got to get into the spermatheca. And, um, yeah, so, I mean, I bet you people don't even know what that process, that competition process looks like. And, you know, 
swarm battles and you know are the, are the sperm from one male kind of like a swarm organism in themselves and they battle against other sperm it's weird it is weird yeah and you think so in the other animals they kind of know that there's competition that occurs called like last male precedence in some cases you know we're like the last male to mate with her you know either has more sperm stored or has you know all the sperms you know becomes really the father of all the offspring the sperm that's stored is it just from one male or is it a mixture of multiple males and you know five percent this ten percent that etc yeah that's a good question and that's one of the things that we kind of know and there's so there's been a, a small number of studies a handful or fewer that have looked for those things and it appears that there really is no sort of last male precedent and it that it's a complete mixture of the males that she's mated with and you can kind of see that and then they've done things where showed, you know, why that's an advantage or why that selection may have occurred. Whereas in a lot of other species, you know, might have multiple matings. They really only have like one father of the offspring. So, say like, I think in some Drosophila and things like that, they have cool things where like the last male sperm, like kills the other male sperm or the first, like, you know, it renders the first male sperm immotile or something like that. So there's really some other cool strategies, but in honeybees, because they mate multiply and because I think because they have this big social structure, they've shown that it would be a major disadvantage evolutionarily for these colonies to have just say like a single male fathering uh, the offspring. So they've done, th you know, the cool thing about honeybees too, is that you can do these instrumental inseminations. So, you know, inseminate a bunch of queens with a single male's sperm, so this, you know, single drone insemination. And then you can pool a bunch of males together and inseminate queens, you know, say with equal volume, but a mixture of different males, put those in colonies and then, walk, and then you know, observe them for time. And they've done that. And then- what It'll be interesting. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I was just going to say what they've shown is that the, the queens inseminated with multiple males, you know, are far superior in lots of, you know, they're more productive, say, in the honey production. They're more, per, like, they have better disease resistance and things like that because the, the colony itself has far greater genetic diversity. You know, it would be interesting um, is if you longitudinally sequenced the brood from a given queen, if she had, you know, multiple male sperm in her, and you see, is there any order to this type of sperm? Like, is there any choosing? Does she somehow know, okay, because of these circumstances, I'm going to choose, you know, guy number three's sperm versus guy number 10. And <laughs> that would be over cool. And I think that they have done that. I think this guy, Ben Olaroid in um, Australia has done some of this work. And I think what they were suggesting is that there is some kind of like packet, I think is maybe the term they used in there, but where you have like say maybe equal amount of each of the males stored but they may kind of like stick together a little bit like where like you have maybe a few hundred of one male is sort of grouped together in these sort of packets you know not in an envelope at all but maybe you could just so then you do have some where like you might have a series of a hundred offspring that are all fertilized by the same male and then the next 50 are from a different male and the next 200 are from a different male and things like that so they have shown a little bit you know it's not perfectly randomized and it's not a perfect mixture where you have like complete randomness from the males i don't know if there's any hmm. if she has any power over selection she certainly no, like, has power like, um, over whether to fertilize them. yeah what if in the um in the winter months certain males are preferred and the offspring always seems to come from them and then in summer months other ones are you know, under certain conditions. I mean, it would be really interesting if there was any correlation like that, which shows decision-making. It would be very cool. Yeah. And like I said, it's, there's really not enough work done on that area. I mean, it's, you know, maybe less than five papers probably that have even addressed the issue in any form. Yes. Yeah, sounds like there's a lot of dynamics. So what, what is the process by which they enter into this organ and what does the inside of the organ look like? Like, has anyone you know, taking it out and looked at it under a microscope and seeing like the morphology of the organ and the placement of the sperm in the organ. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Yeah, I mean, a little bit. I, I think there are some micrographs, like electron micrographs, where they, you know, take it out and they do that thing where they freeze it and slice it into sections and, and image it. You know, one of the things I thought when I first started working in this was 
how much is done by the female in order to move sperm in there. And so in mammal systems, you know, we have cilia throughout the reproductive tract. And so a lot of that movement from after mating to the sperm making it like up into the horn of the uterus and being able to fertilize eggs way up there is that a lot of that sperm isn't people think of it as just like the sperm swimming up there but there's ciliary like wave like motion that sweeps sperm up and kind of carries them up into the horn of the uterus in a lot of mammals but Hmm. so i was curious about that in honeybees but it, it seems like they're there's no cilia in the reproductive tract in honeybee queens. And people have tried to do this and they've shown it, you know, in mammals, what they do is you have like these really small silica beads. And so you can inseminate with these beads and you, then they find these beads that obviously don't have a flagella and aren't swimming, will be deposited way up in the horn of the uterus, let's say. And so they've done that with honeybees and using, you know, freeze killed dead sperm and they do not make it to the spermatheca. So one thing I think they've shown pretty well is that it is the sperm swimming. There could be some muscle contraction that helps move the sperm into there, but it seems to require motility for sperm to make it into the spermatheca. And that's how do you say that? How do you stuff. say that word again? Spermatheca or tika or what? Sperma, yeah, spermatheca. And the last four letters are what? F or S or? Theca, like T H E C A. Oh, spermatheca. Okay. Interesting. Is there any literature on the structure of the spermatheca or no? I, not that, I mean, how, if I say no, I'm sure that somebody would correct. I think it's probably hard to imagine that there's not a publication, at least on the, you know, like I said, in some kind of like electron micrograph style imaging of it. And we know like, for example, there's things like the exterior part of the spermatheca is covered in a tracheal net which you know and there's and we know a little bit about like say the there are spermatheca accessory glands so there's certainly a lot that goes into storing that sperm right it's not just like some simple sack that holds the sperm it's like a it requires accessory gland input it clearly requires some oxygen to feed the cells of that organ and those cells must be doing stuff to maintain that that sperm in a viable state for so long. Yeah, that's really crazy. I mean, I think this would be of interest to people that want to learn how to preserve them in some kind of like human-made proxy instead of a spermatheca. I mean, so people should study it. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think so, for sure. Yeah, it's really cool because they these sperm aren't... I mean, the other thing that's you know different from mammals is that the sperm don't have mitochondria, which, you know, are those like little power factories producing ATP. So in in mammals, they have this mitochondria and they contribute that, say, to the embryo and all kinds of cool stuff. But And they require oxygen, just like a sort of normal respiratory uh, process for cell energy. But honeybee, or really, I think all insect sperm do not have mitochondria, which is super bizarre. And they have this other structure called the nebenkern, which is kind of a cool word, but which is a, pro, a crystalline protein-like product that is kind of serves the function of mitochondria, but it's not like true mitochondria. So they have an entirely different metabolic process for energy and you know, motility. It's pretty cool. So what's your research focused on? Um, it, originally, you know, it was really focused on developing sort of workable methods for cryopreservation of honeybee semen, and then maybe more what you might call more like practical. So I work a lot on beekeeping management practices. I work a lot on, you know, how to better control varroa mites, for example, which is a big issue for you know, beekeeping all over the world. Um, and I work on indoor storage of honeybees, which is you know storing them in these giant buildings for the winter. Well, you know what what occurred to me is um, if you want to get good at the cryopreservation of the bee semen, I mean you might want to consider like cryopreserving the entire queen because you know the the sperm are in a happy place in the spermatheca, and if you freeze the whole queen, you've got you know a young one, you've got a lot of them in there, and then when you thaw it out, you could selectively take out you know the ones that you want, and they'd probably be in a or they were in a somewhat happy state before you froze them, you know? Yeah, yeah. The one thing we, I mean, the problem we have, like, in the world of cryobiology is that 
we're severely limited by the size of the things that we can freeze. And some people, you know, say, oh, well, I heard, you know, frogs can freeze or these fish you can freeze, but they're not frozen down to that level, you know, liquid nitrogen temperature, which is minus 198 degrees. So there is a lot of work on it, but even say like there's been work on freezing fish eggs or freezing frog eggs, the way that we freeze like mammalian embryos. Um, and even those are too big. So freezing whole organisms like that hasn't been possible yet. It's what happens is because the big problem you have is ice formation in cells. So most people maybe have left a can of soda in their freezer too long or bottle of water outside and it expands, right? So that water expands when it crystallizes and it blows up the can or shreds it. And so that's what happens to cells when you when you try to freeze them is that the ice crystallization either expands or it becomes like these crystals that are sharp, you can imagine, on like a microscopic level and it and it destroys cell membranes and it shreds cells and does all kind of damage. And so, so you, you get, get like freezer than, burn. Like yeah, burn. yeah, exactly. And so the problem with freezing anything more than like a single cell at a time, like, and you can freeze like blood cells, you know, but you can imagine those as a bunch of separate cells in a liquid. You get like more than a few cells together and you have like that ice crystallization issue and that you can't sort of protect those cells well enough and then they get shredded and so everything in cryobiology is about sort of preventing that ice crystal formation and the damage caused by freezing and so we do that a few different ways but you add cryoprotectants that can either dehydrate the cells and draw water out of the cell before freezing or you have these what are called cell permeating cryoprotectants that actually go into the cell and they they adjust the freezing temperature basically or affect the freezing uh qual i don't know what you call it you know affect the freezing rate and ice crystal formation of the water that does, that's remaining in the cell well very good so uh, let's talk about some of the other research you're doing you're working on ways to store lots of bees inside buildings for winter like what what happens normally with with hives in the winter, are they okay to sit outside or will the bees die? Do you have to cover them? And what are you doing to uh, store bees in the winter? Yeah, great question. So yeah, they're fine outside. So you imagine before people started putting bees in boxes, um, you know, they're inside a hollowed out tree all winter in, in Germany or something like that. And they're perfectly fine. And they've been doing that for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. But so the problem is for or the issue for beekeepers, say in Canada and the U.S. was, and I should say, you know, this is all really stems from Canada, where they, you know, have longer, more harsh winters, and so those beekeepers were kind of the pioneers of the idea of putting bees indoors or in cellars to kind of help keep them alive for the long, hard winter. They're perfectly fine sitting outside, let's say, here in Washington or in California or North Dakota. The problem is is that on a commercial scale, so a hobby beekeeper, you have five hives in your backyard, generally perfectly fine sitting out there. You can do some extra things like wrap them. You have to be careful of ventilation. So you can kind of help bees a little bit for the winter, but generally speaking, they're perfectly fine sitting out there in the winter. And we've had hives that were completely buried up to the lid in snow for a month in addition to all the other harsh winter climates and they're perfectly fine. So it's really not an issue of cold or anything like that. The the problem is is that we have I shouldn't say the problem. I don't the issue I guess we have is that we have a huge demand for honeybee colonies to pollinate almonds. And it's the economic driver for the commercial beekeeping industry. And that pollination event occurs, you know, pretty early in February. And so you have, uh, what is it now? Over 2 million colonies have to be moved to California in January and early February. And so if I'm a beekeeper, I have two choices, really. Let's say if I leave them outdoors in North Dakota or Montana, I generally I'm not going to be able to get to those bees to move them to California at, in January or February because they're buried in snow and I've got to move 10,000 colonies on semi-trucks. You know, I can't be getting like stuck in the snow and 
going to a hundred different places to gather these colonies up. So what beekeepers have done in past and still do, you know, to a large degree is when the weather starts to turn, say in October, or November, I just take all my bees down to California before the wet, before the snow comes. And they place them in oftentimes these large holding areas where they might have 20 semi loads worth of bees, maybe 10,000, 20,000 colonies, some landowner's ranch or something like that. And all those bees are in close proximity to each other. There's no flowers blooming. There's really no food whatsoever. But there's plenty of days where it's warm enough and those bees are flying. They're robbing each other out. They're spreading diseases. They're spreading parasites. Generally, a really poor condition for those bees all the way from November, December, January, and then the almonds bloom in February and things get a little better. But the alternative is to put them in a cool, dark building, say refrigerator temperature, like 40 degrees. It's too cold for them to fly, it's too dark. They just huddle in their boxes, feeding on their honey. The temperature is held perfectly state, you know, relatively perfectly stable at 40 degrees instead of outdoors where it may be 60 degrees during the day and 20 degrees at night. And so basically just putting them indoors gives them a stable temperature, concrete floors. You can drive a semi truck right into the building. They load it with a forklift and then it heads down to California when they're needed in February. So bees in the winter, they may not venture out for a few months. Correct. Yeah. In these northern, you know, northern states, northern latitudes. Okay. Yeah. Because I was wondering, how could you keep them anywhere when they want to go out? I thought they would go out all the time, at least, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So as long as it's cold enough and or dark enough, the bees just stay in their boxes. So that's it. So most yeah. of the bees get moved at night and, you know, they just stay in their boxes. Yeah. I have a weird question. I'm thinking about people like, you know, people have to go to the bathroom and stuff and I'm sure bees too, but do they do it outside the hive or inside? Yeah. That's a good question. That's amazing that you thought of that. Yeah. They, they try to go outside the hive. And so those bees that are in there all winter, they have to hold it. And there is a, a common disease, I guess you'd call it, pathogen, I guess, um, nosema, nosema apis or nosema serrana, which is like an intestinal gut pathogen. And the common symptom, say, of that is that you open the hive and maybe they're all dead or they're almost all dead and you'll find feces, bee poop, like diarrhea all over inside the hive and it basically gives them dysentery diarrhea and they can't hold it all winter and so they end up defecating inside the hive and, and all over kind of the front of the hive and stuff and it's kind of gross but yeah so normally a good healthy colony holds it until they get a warm day to go out and fly and then you don't well, want to be gonna, anywhere near there. If you're going to store them in a building why not cycle the temperature like once a week or once every two weeks have like a warm period you put the lights on you have a place for the bees to go inside the building and then, you know, it goes cold for two weeks and then cycle it like that so you don't have that problem. Yeah, that's a good question. I, mainly because if they're strong and healthy colonies, they, they're they fine holding it for, I mean, in Canada, they may store them indoors for four or five months. And here we're talking maybe three months. So they have no problem holding it if they're healthy. The other reason is that you don't want for any reason those bees to come out of the boxes when they're inside that building because you have buildings now that are purpose built for bees and a lot of guys still use potato cellars these large commercial potato sheds or onion sheds but they have now purpose-built facilities that hold 40,000 colonies and so if you in any way did something like you know if refrigeration failed or it got too warm and the bees come out it is like a disaster. I mean, you have, you'd have like the floors might be a foot deep in like dead bees and you'd, they wouldn't find their way back to their hive because they're all, st I mean, they're stacked up, you know, to the mm, feet okay. and then they're like stacked together. They just wouldn't find their way back to their hive. It would, it would make a real mess. I gotcha. And the, the other thing is that shown, you know, with, and these are these, you know, Canadian guys who pioneered this, showed that Bees are like, they're most like metabolically efficient at 40 degrees Fahrenheit or four degrees Celsius. So if it's warmer than that, they're more active and they're burning more calories and they're consuming more of their stored honey. And if it's colder than that, they're consuming more food and 
energy vibrating wing muscles to maintain that cluster temperature. Because even in the winter, um, no matter what the temperature is outside, they maintain a temperature in the center of that cluster of bees at about 75 degrees, 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, I heard they, I don't know if they beat their wings or vibrate their bodies or something, but they can make it much warmer inside the hive. Right. And so they do that regardless all year round. And so at 40 degrees, they're their most efficient. So they consume the least amount of honey stores. And so it's like, it's best for them at a nice, steady, constant temperature. And that's one of the big advantages of the indoor storage. There's a lot of other advantages too. I mean, just from the management aspect, I mean, you have beekeepers that get to stay home with their families for Christmas rather than sending guys down to California to to feed their bees and check on the bees and treat the bees. So in addition to the, you know, easing the pest pressure and disease and parasite pressure, it's easier on the, the beekeepers. The Gloria de Grandy Hoffman at the USDA lab in Tucson showed that it's a little more economical because you don't have to feed the bees continuously throughout the winter. There's a lot of big advantages. And that's why just in the last few years, I think probably getting close to I don't know, three quarters of a million colonies are stored indoors now for the winter. And that's, you know, up from maybe just a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand four or five years ago. So during this time they eat, but the the queen doesn't do anything, they don't produce any new brood. Right. Which is a which is a huge advantage in itself also because I mean it gets kinda in depth here, but varroa mites, which most people would argue is the number one problem for beekeepers and causes the greatest number of losses and all that is those varroa mites reproduce in the the sealed brood of the developing bees. And so most pesticides really can't kill mites when they're in that sealed capped brood. And so brood is great for building bees and all that stuff, but it's also great for varroa mites. By putting them in the cold and the dark and ensuring that they kind of stop their reproductive rate, you know, they stop producing new bees, then it gives you a chance to then treat those colonies, say, right when they come out of the storage with like a single application of something like oxalic acid, which is an organic acid compound. And you can get rid of, a, you know, a high percentage of mites with a single application, reducing, you know, your pesticide input into the hive and increasing sort of your time and labor efficiency and all that stuff. So, Whereas if you're storing bees in California and you're feeding them syrup and you're feeding them pollen patties to keep them going and active throughout the winter, they're actively producing brood all, all winter, which means they're actively growing varroa mites. The varroa mites are reproducing if the bees are reproducing. And so you have more pest pressure, more spread of viruses, all kinds of problems. So if you put them in the in storage and they have varroa mites in the colony, do the varroa mites starve to death or they just keep feeding as the bees feed? Yeah, what happens is they don't starve to death because they can feed on adults. They just can't build their population. They just can't reproduce. And so the you know a certain number will just kind of slowly age and die. Like you might lose, you know, just without doing anything, you might lose 40% of the, the mites throughout the winter just from them you know old age and all kinds of stuff but they do feed they continue to feed on the adults they're called phoretic mites and they they get in under these under the plates on the abdomen and they feed on the fat bodies of the adult bees and so it's not great and you know the number one sort of predictor of colony survival is the that varroa mite population in september so you know beekeepers generally try not to go into the winter with a lot of mites in the colonies they try to have that cleaned up by September. But in some cases they do, and you almost, you know, you can't ever get rid of varroa mites. You're always going to have some low level, no matter how good a beekeeper you are. And so giving uh, the bees a, a chance to take a break from reproduction also prevents varroa mites from growing. Do the bees groom each other and eat the varroa mites off each other or no? There is a bit of that behavior, mite grooming, and there has been some work at, I wanted to say Penn State, but that's wrong. Greg Hunt, oh, Purdue, had a breeding program where they were looking at, they basically put sticky cards, these mats under the hive, 
and then look at them and they look at every individual mite like under a microscope and they look for damage to the mite by the you know from maybe the mandibles of the workers chewing and biting mites off of each other and then the you know the hive that has the most of that damage on the mites they would breed and select from that you know and i'm, I'm probably butchering the, the process because we i didn't do it but so they had a program where they were and i think they are still actively doing this and they probably have some cool name you know like mite biters or something like that and so they there has been some work selecting for that behavior because we definitely need more sort of breeding and selection for mite resistance because i don't think you know, treating with pesticides is not gonna save the beekeeping world from varroa mites well if you look to wild populations i'm sure there probably is some of honeybees i mean they're, they're doing no one's really taking care of those hives but they're i would guess they're surviving so are there individuals in wild populations that are resistant for, to varroa mites oh man yeah that's great yeah so there are you know maybe one of the more famous bee researchers tom seeley has uh documented these wild populations in new york in the are not forest um that have been surviving in these trees and without beekeepers and clearly aren't being treated and and so yeah and so they're surviving with varroa mites and so he's done some work looking at how that's possible and so there's a few different things that could be going on one is that because you're not treating them with pesticides and because you're not propagating more colonies you, maybe there's not this sort of selection because really it's not a good strategy for a, a varroa mite, a parasite to kill its host, right? That is not great. And that usually doesn't work out for either one. And so ideally the parasite lives with the host without killing it. So, but because beekeepers continue to propagate regardless of how like nasty and awful the parasite is, in some ways we're probably selecting for more virulent parasites than the population would normally sustain without our intervention so it could be that the mites themselves are less virulent but it's also there's things they measured the nesting cavity so the colonies i think generally in the wild maintain smaller cavities so the colonies are smaller um, they swarm more often that's one strategy to kind of reduce your parasite load as you swarm what, what does that mean they swarm yeah they swarm like as in reproductive swarm so that's where you have one hive and then you grow too big for your tree and then you make a a bunch of queen cells you know you prepare by making a bunch of virgins basically and so the old queen and half the high, half the bees all fly out and they go find a new tree to make a new nest and they leave behind all the brood and most of the parasites and a bunch of bees and then those you know those new virgin queens emerge they fight it out one becomes the the new queen she flies out and mates comes back to that original old nest and then that nest ideally would continue to to be a hive right and so that's how one hive becomes two becomes four is this reproductive swarming and so that's one way to reduce your pressure if you're swarming kind of if you send out 10 swarms you know, maybe half of them die or something, but you still have five new colonies that were made. That's one way to kind of outgrow your your parasite pressure and also kind of leave a lot of parasite pressure behind. And so they just showed, you know, basically that you can swarm a lot, you can have a smaller colony, which but that means they produce less honey. So it's a lot of these characteristics that would allow, say, a wild population to survive with varroa mites is not really a great characteristic for a beekeeper what what happens to the varroa mites when the bees go out and about pollinating and stuff do they leave them on flowers and then other bees can pick them up like do the oh. varroa mites know to drop off at certain times that's a good question i don't know the answer to that specifically i think i think that's possible but my guess would be that that is a, is very rare i think kind of like what you're asking is how does say varroa mites get from one hive to the other or, um, how do they get spread around? And so generally, I think one way that we know for certain that if you had a magic wand and you could make a hive completely free of Varroa, how would it ever get Varroa? I think the main way that it would get Varroa is either your Varroa-free hive is really strong and powerful and healthy. And so, and then in the fall, 
when there's no flowers, generally beehives go pick on each other and that's called robbing. So strong hives go and they, you know, actually to other beehives to steal their honey and stuff like that and pollen. And so that robbing behavior and generally those weak hives are the ones with the highest parasite pressure, varroa pressure. And so when that bee goes in there to steal honey, it's walking around in that hive. There's mites on the comb and on the other bees. And then those mites get on that rob that robbing bee. And then that robber bee flies back to its hive, which say in a this magical world didn't have varroa and now has varroa. So this robbing behavior spreads a lot of, you know, it moves mites from one hive to the other. And the varroa mites themselves, like, have you studied them much? Like their morphology and are there different kinds and, you know, their life cycle have, and all that stuff? Yeah, I haven't much, but there definitely is, right? I mean, these were, and the reason they're such a problem is that these, they're not a native pest of European honeybees. They, you know, they haven't evolved together for thousands of years or whatever. So this is a pest that, Host shifted from the Asian honeybee, Apis serrana, which is a different species in Asia. And so when humans brought the honeybees we're familiar with, Western honeybees, into Asia in the same area where Apis serrana was, eventually this varroa mite evolved, adapted, whatever you want to say, to live in Western honeybees. It then got like a new species name. So I think originally it was Apis jacobsoni is the still you know it's still a parasite in apis serrana and now we have a or varroa destructor which is the the new sort of species if you will that's on western honeybees but that's where that host shift occurred you know and that was just within the last hundred years or less and so western honey you know and then beeky you know and then beekeepers move those bees up through china and into across you know sort of siberia and into russia and then and then varroa mites got into everywhere in Europe and then over to you know, South America. And so, yeah, and then people have looked at, there's some stuff from Maryland and Dennis Van Engel's Storch Lab where they've been measuring the size of varroa and showing that there does seem to be some clusters of some different morphology. So there is some, there are some differences in varroa itself. Um, and it, amazingly, you know, you would think that it's such a huge problem from that same lab from Dennis's lab there's a guy Samuel Ramsey I think he works for USDA now but they used to think varroa fed on hemolymph like the blood of bees and everyone said that all the textbooks said that this guy Samuel Ramsey as a PhD student in Dennis Van Engel's lab doing you know some stuff with electron microscopy talking with someone who was like an expert in in other kinds of mites said, hey, you know, I don't basically have this hypothesis that, well, based on that genus and looking at these mouth parts, it does, they don't really seem like what you would call a blood feeding kind of mite. And so they, they did some work and showed that they don't feed on hemolymph, they don't feed on blood. And in fact, what they feed on is these fat bodies in the bees, which that kind of like basic stuff seems very important if you're trying to like control and figure out ways to yeah, definitely. And that was like, I mean, that was three years ago or something like that. Well, it seems and like the there's tons, and... tons to learn about bees and people need to really allocate more research money to, to them, you know, like storing sperm and all this stuff. Yeah, especially when you consider, you know, most people have hear, heard these facts now, you know, that like one in every three bites you take is food pollinated by bees and they contribute whatever the eighteen billion dollars in agriculture for the pollinated crops that they do. And yeah, it's a big deal and, and we really don't know as much as much as we should. Well very good. Brendan, what's the best way to, for people to find out more about your research? Where can they go? Um they can go, you know, the Washington State University entomology website or you can email me at B as in boy um, Hopkins at WSU dot edu. Okay. Well very good. Well, Brandon, thanks for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. It's great. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? 
Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.